Assalamu alaikum and greetings of peace to all of you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brendan, for that um, a very warm introduction. Although I must say uh, that the last time I was uh, here in Hamilton, uh, I had a much uh, bigger audience uh, to, to receive me. But of course, that audience was much more hostile. <laughs> uh, it was the Zionist lobby. Uh, they didn't want me to speak here, and my topic at that time was uh, Iran in the crosshairs. And um, they didn't want me to speak about it, I wanted to speak about why it is not appropriate to attack Iran. We don't want any more wars, but the Zionists wanted to have wars. Uh, and of course they came out, uh, their reception was not um, uh, positive, but what they did was, by making all that noise, uh, they got a lot of people into that meeting. So we had a huge, huge turnout at, the, at McMaster University. And of course, you know, they wanted to ask questions as well. We were more than happy to, to answer their questions. Uh, but anyway, uh, they sort of suggested that um, people should fear me. So let's start off. How many of you fear me? I'm a Muslim. Please raise your hands. <clears throat> Yeah, there is a sister who fears. <laughs> <laughs> you have your own army? <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So I, you know, I have my, my, my army outside. <laughs> you know, I don't know, apart from uh, maybe killing flies, I don't think I've killed anything else. Uh, you know, so I hope that you, you wouldn't really um, be concerned. Now, <clears throat> I was told to uh, talk about uh, starting with uh, this new Hollywood movie, American Sniper, and then uh, bring it forward to uh, the Charlie Hebdo affair in, in Paris, uh, what's happening in the Muslim world, and perhaps uh, also touch on uh, what our very own dear Prime Minister, Mr. Harper, is trying to scare everybody out of their wits. Uh, in fact, on January the 30th, he was in our town, where our center is located, uh, in Richmond Hill, and um, he, in fact, uh, tried to scare the daylights out of everybody to tell them that uh, Muslims are coming, these people are coming, and you all need to you know, run into your homes, into the basement, shut your doors, and don't come out. And uh, Harper is going to save you. And he's going to save us on the basis of his Bill C-51. I'll, I'll have uh, something to say about that a little later. But this movie, American Sniper, regrettably is nothing but a very vicious propaganda piece that actually demonizes Muslims. <clears throat> now Chris Kyle, the, the hero of this particular movie, uh, according to his claims, uh, is known to have shot or, and killed at least 161 people in Iraq. And he was of course a sniper, so he was hiding several kilometers away or uh, lying on a rooftop, and anybody who saw that he didn't like, he would just, you know, uh, fire his rifle and blow their brains away. According to his own admission, uh, he killed women, he killed children, he killed people that he thought were going to attack American soldiers. So that's his, according to his own admission. And this is being glorified in this movie, and the Iraqi people are being presented as savages. Now, see, any time there is a war, there is always an attempt to demonize the enemy. And you present the enemy in the worst kind of light in order to justify their killing, even if it is unwarranted. Mm -hmm. And regrettably, Hollywood has been at it for a long time. I'm sure you know that if you have watched, and I'm sure many of you would have watched many um, Western movies, uh, you would see how they present the First Nations people in those Western movies. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, the ugly caricatures of the Arabs was presented because they were the ones that were being targeted. And today, of course, uh, Muslims in general are being targeted, so they are being presented as savages. I'm sure you know Iraq uh, is a country that has a history of something like 10,000 years. And I don't think a country that gave us the Babylonian civilization 
where Prophet Abraham was born could be a country of savages, particularly by a country that has a history of only 200 years. So I think we really need to keep these things in perspective. But regrettably, what um, American Sniper has done, and in fact the whole environment in the United States, uh, their media projection of Muslims in a very, very negative light, leading, uh, led by Fox News, but of course CNN and others. On February the 10th, three young students in Whitechapel, North Carolina, were gunned down. In fact, they were killed execution style. Three brilliant young students, a husband and wife, Dia Barakat and, and his wife Yusser, both of them students uh, of dentistry at uh, University of North Carolina and, and Yusser's sister, younger sister, an architectural student, uh, 18 years or 19 years old, they were all, all three of them killed in their dormitory execution style. And of course, you know, initially the US media even ignored this event, they wouldn't even cover it, but when the pressure built up, they said, oh, it's just, uh, this was a dispute over a parking space. Well, you don't go and kill three people execution style or over a parking space conflict. I think this was a, a, an attempt to justify a, a horrific crime. I also want to touch on this aspect of how, uh, in our own country, various issues are covered. And then I'll try to link it with uh, Mr. Harper's attempt to push down this, uh, uh, this bill down our throats. In October, uh, there were two incidents, one in Montreal and the other in Ottawa. Uh, in the first case, uh, a person who we were told is a Muslim convert, uh, he slammed his vehicle into two uh, military personnel and one of them unfortunately was killed and then this guy uh, fled in his vehicle and of course there was a police chase and later on his car flipped and the police said that they uh, that uh, he did not surrender when he was asked to surrender and he had a knife on him and they had to shoot him. Now the Toronto Star on that day carried a story and this was only for a couple of hours on the Toronto Star website. They said that when the guy came out of the car he had his hands up and yet the police shot him not once but six times. They wanted to make sure that they eliminate this guy. They didn't want him captured alive. The next incident that occurred in Ottawa, the man was known to be a mental case. He was actually thrown out of a mosque in BC because of his strange habits. And he was in a homeless shelter. And we still haven't been able to find this answer as to how he came into the possession of a weapon. Who gave him that weapon? How did it happen? How did he manage to jump into a car, go into parliament building, and was able to, uh, uh, you know, rampage through there, when in fact all the RCMP officers are armed over there. So how was this guy able to obtain a rifle? And why was he not captured alive? He could have been incapacitated, but he was also killed. And both of these persons were described as terrorists because they were Muslims. Now here is a list of other incidents that I want to share with you. In October, there was a Canadian war veteran who had stacked a lot of guns and explosives in Alberta and he was going to target a number of federal buildings. His wife actually called the police and said, this, my husband, is dangerous, he's armed, he's got explosives, and he has plans to blow up this building these building, federal buildings. Of course, the police were able to arrest him, and they said he's a nutcase. So that's the first nutcase for you. <laughs> a few weeks later, in Ottawa, there was a chemist, Dr. Phillips, his name, Chris Phillips. He had chemicals stored in a hotel room, and his plan was to attack a number of buildings in Ottawa. Again, he was described as a nutcase not a terrorist. On February the 14th, Valentine's Day incidentally, two people in Halifax 
were planning to attack uh, several malls because they had weapons with them. And even our justice minister, Peter McKay, said, no, no, he's a nutcase. Oh, these were nutcases. They're not terrorists. These are not terrorist incidents. So it seems to me that if a Muslim is involved in any incident, that becomes an act of terror. But if a non-Muslim is involved in it, then that becomes an, a case of a nutcase. So it seems to me that unfortunately, Canada is producing a lot of nutcases these days. <laughs> and I think it's a sad reflection on our officials that they refuse to accept that there are other people that are involved. And if, you know, we are being told and we are told to be really scared of Muslim terrorists, they are all over. And you know, on January the 30th, when Ms. Mr. Harper was asked, if one of the reporters asked him, and unfortunately I couldn't go there because it was Friday, and I was involved for Friday prayers at our center, and I couldn't go to attend uh, Mr. Harper's meeting. I wanted to, but I couldn't because of the timings. He was asked by one of the reporters to say, Mr. Harper, if you had Bill C-51 already in your hands, would you have been able to prevent the attack in Montreal and in Ottawa? And he said, I don't know. And he said, but whether these Muslims are being radicalized in a basement or in mosques, they pose a threat to Canada. And he was only a couple of kilometers away from where we were. I wish Harper had had the decency to come and visit our mosque and see whether we are radicalizing people or we are involved in our regular worship and prayers. But it, unfortunately, we are sort of, you know, now being targeted in a way and, and we are being told that we don't belong here anymore. Well, if I'm going to be treated as a second-class citizen, uh, I have an offer for Mr. Harper. If I'm going to be a second-class citizen, then please don't ask me to pay my full taxes. You know, why should I pay all my taxes when I want to treat it second-class citizen? I'll pay only half my taxes. I'm prepared to make this deal with you. <laughs> then you can treat me as a second-class citizen. That's okay. But I don't think he'll accept this offer from me. And let me tell you, I came to this country at the age of 23, fully qualified, from the best universities in Britain, fully qualified, I've come and I've worked every day of my life, all the 40 or 41 years of my life over here. I've created a number of jobs in this country and I continue to create jobs in this country. I made a choice to come to this country and I was selected on the basis of my qualifications. I didn't sneak into this country. And I, apart from perhaps maybe an occasional parking ticket or so, mm -hmm. I haven't had any record of any illegal activities or any crimes. And yet, Mr. Harper will tell you, you should fear me. And I'm really amazed. You know, it's, it's such an incredible sort of, you know, situation that we face ourselves, uh, face ourselves in. But you know, this whole notion of Islamophobia is nothing new. It has existed for a long time, but regrettably, after 9-11, it gained respectability. Because the new cons in the United States <coughs> decided that they need to wage endless wars. And previously, they would pick up individuals and demonize individuals. And that was the policy that they pursued. But later on, they realized that uh, individuals do not have a long enough shelf life. So you see, an individual can be killed. So whether you demonize Saddam Hussein, you can have him hanged. Whether you demonize Osama bin Laden, you can kill him. Or you demonize Gaddafi, you can kill him. Then what do you do after that? You don't have an identifiable villain to demonize anymore. Then I now to find a new one. So they decided to create groups of villains. Al-Qaeda is an American creation. I can tell you that. You know, the, the Pakistani uh, politician Imran Khan, I don't know how many of you are familiar with him, but anyway, in the year uh, 2009, June of 2009, you can Google it and you'll find out, he had come to wa Washington, D.C. to speak. And he was invited by people who uh, have this uh, NGO called, or think tank, American Century. He was speaking in Washington, D.C., CIA officials, State Department officials, several senators were present in that meeting, and this is what he said in that meeting publicly. He said, in December of 1989, 
I was invited by the American ambassador in Pakistan to visit the US Embassy in Islamabad in December of 1989. And he said, who did I find in the US Embassy? Osama bin Laden. He said, I met Osama bin Laden in the American Embassy in December of 1989. And we are told Osama bin Laden was an enemy of the Americans. What the hell was he doing in the American Embassy in Islamabad in December of 1989? Imran Khan said it publicly and nobody, not one person stood up to challenge him. Okay, that's the first thing. Today we are being told that ISIL, ISIS or Daesh or whatever names they give to them, it's a terrorist group and we are fighting against them. Well, let me give you some facts and figures. Okay, I'm going to give you references so that you can go and check them. I'm going to start off with the French former foreign minister Roland Dumas on in June of 2013 he was giving an interview to the French television station LCP and he said that before the conflict in Syria erupted two years before that he had gone to Britain on some other business and he met British officials and they told him two years before 2011 that Britain was about to launch operations in Syria. Would France be interested in joining them? This was two years before anything started in Syria. And this is the French, former French foreign minister speaking. Number two, there is a Syrian opposition leader by the name of Hassan Manna. He's a, he's a you know, well-known uh, you know, Syrian opposition leader. He said, that in February of 2011, a meeting was called in Paris. And who was present in that meeting? This is the Syrian opposition leader speaking about that meeting that took place in Paris. He said, at that meeting were Syrian opposition leaders, the American ambassador in Israel, Dan Shapiro, America's former ambassador in Lebanon, Jeffrey Feldman, and Saudi Arabia's then intelligence chief, Bandar bin Sultan, who just, just recently, only a couple of weeks ago, was fired from his position as security advisor to the king of Saudi Arabia. They were also present. And at that meeting, it was decided that Saudi Arabia and America will supply weapons to the Syrian people, and they're going to start an uprising in a small town called Dar'a. Now, Dar'a is only about 10 kilometers from the Jordanian border. Now, see, normally when uprisings start in any country, they would start in major cities, right? Like, you know, if, when, you, when we have demonstrations, you wouldn't go to, let's say, Woodstock, Ontario, to start an uprising or a demonstration. Hardly anybody would pay attention to it. But if you have to do it either in Toronto, in Ottawa, Montreal, you're not going to do it in a small town. They started their uprising in Dar'a. Why? Because it was only 10 kilometers from the Jordanian border and they could smuggle weapons into there. And that's what they did. And this is the Syrian opposition leader saying that this is what these people did. And he said, I was dead against this because I knew that if they arm the opposition in Syria, there's going to be total chaos. The country is going to be destroyed. We are not going to achieve any of our objectives. And that's what they're going to do. Number three. Craig Whitlock. He's a Washington Post reporter. On April the 17th, 2011, he was quoting WikiLeaks sources, and he said that the United States has been involved in supporting Syrian opposition groups from as early as 2005. This is published in the Washington Post. And he was quoting sources from WikiLeaks, because these were secret American documents that came out in public. Philip Giraldi, who's uh, an ex-CIA, writing in the American Conservative on December the 19th, 2011, he said that Americans have been supplying weapons to the Syrian rebels through Turkey for many years. This is what he has been, he's been doing for many years. This is what Philip Giraldi said. In fact, a number of other people have also reported this, but I'll skip that. But let me just mention to you, two days ago, Monday, February 23rd, two days ago, an Iraqi member of parliament publicly stated, he actually made this 
a statement that the Iraqi army has shot down two British transport planes that were supplying weapons to these ISIL and ISIS terrorists in northern Iraq. Shame. A, 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 an Iraqi Shame. parliament just two days ago. Last November, the leader of Iran, Ayatollah Khamenei, is speaking to foreign guests, and it so happened that I was present in that meeting. I was invited to a conference. He said that we have evidence that the United States has dropped weapons allegedly for Kurdish forces, and yet these weapons have been dropped in areas controlled by these ISIS and ISIL terrorists on five different occasions. And he said, if they make a mistake once, we can accept it. They can make a mistake twice, but they can't make a mistake five times. Five times is a deliberate policy. That means that they are actually supplying weapons to these people. Now, the question that we need to ask is why? And who are these? What are they doing? I mean, you know, look, you know, at the beginning of this month, February the 3rd, that horrific video, I mean, it shuddered. Anybody who saw that, I saw it and I couldn't sleep for several nights when they burnt that poor Jordanian pilot alive, no matter what his crime or what his you know, follies or whatever, burning any person alive is a horrendous crime. It is condemned in Islam utterly. It is absolutely not permissible. In fact, let me tell you, in the Quran, you know, there are people, unfortunately, that keep on targeting Muslims and the Quran and so on. In the Quran, it is clearly stipulated that if you kill an innocent person, it is as if you have killed the whole of humanity. This is in the Quran. And I'll give you the reference. It's in, in chapter 5. It's called Surah Al-Maidah, verse number 8. You can go and check it. In fact, it says, if you kill an innocent person, it is as if you have killed the whole of humanity. And if you, kill, you, you save one innocent life, it is as if you have saved the whole of humanity. That is how much value Islam places on human life. And yet we are told, we are demons, we are terrorists, we want to kill people, etc., etc. Regrettably, that's not the case. And I think we need to be really, really very, very careful. Now let me sort of come to the final point with respect to what Mr. Harper is trying to do with respect to this uh, bill that he wants to build. It has already, you know, gone through second reading. It was uh, passed two days ago, and now it's going further. And Regrettably, among the opposition parties, even the liberals are saying they'll go ahead with it. They just need certain sort of oversight mechanisms. Only the NDP has said that they will oppose this bill because it's not necessary. And let me add a sort of, you know, a little bit of a, a background to this issue. Uh, immediately after 9-11, when Bill C-36 was being passed, at that time, the RCMP commissioner himself said, in May of 2012, in a meeting in Toronto, he said that we don't need Bill C-36. We have enough powers to take care of all of the security issues or all of the security threats that we face. Even today, all of the people that are either involved in even thinking about any terrorist acts or any illegal acts, they are all known to the RCMP and they are known to CSIS. In fact, the RCMP itself has said, we know all the people that have gone to Syria and we know all the people that have come back. So our question to them is, well, why don't you go and arrest those people? If you know them, just go arrest them. Why are you targeting the rest of us? Why are you demonizing the rest of us? Why? You know why? Because, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Harper doesn't have any other policies to fall back on. You know, his, his, his party members are en ensnared in all these scandals. Mike Duffy is going to be, you know, put on trial shortly. Uh, you know, the $90,000 that he dished out, or he received, and, and some of his, you know, Mr. Harper's own people, and then the MPs involved in other kinds of uh, corrupt practices, etc. And the robocalls and a whole list of other things. So what, do, what does Mr. Harper do? Change the subject, change the channel. So divert your and my attention to this imaginary threat, and you say, oh, you should all be scared of these people, and I'm the only one who's going to save you from that. Well, I'm afraid I have to say 
that we should fear Mr. Harper more than we should fear any imaginary threat. <laughs> and you know, this is a threat to all of our rights. Four former prime ministers on, on February 19th, uh, in the Globe and Mail, they were reported four former prime ministers, including uh, John Cretchen, Paul Martin, Joe Clark, a conservative prime minister, and John Turner, several Supreme Court justices, several former security officials, including an oversight commissioner for RCMP, they said that the way Mr. Harper is pushing this bill is going to erode our civil liberties. And we should be very, very concerned and very careful. In fact, they all called for stringent oversights for the powers that are being given to these security agencies. And you know how CSIS came into existence in 1984? Because the RCMP was involved in all kinds of illegal activities. And now, the same powers are being granted to all of them to go and continue to do these things. You know, all of the, 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 the people that were arrested in various so-called terrorist activities, for instance, the Toronto 18, none of them, none of those 18 people of course, seven of them were let go free because they were not, you know, guilty of anything. I actually sat in the courtroom to listen to the testimony and so on. There were three government RCMP informants that had infiltrated that group. And those three informants were actually misleading these poor kids. They were fools, of course, and they have ended up paying a heavy price. But one of them, calling himself Mubin Sheikh, he collected $370,000. And there was an Afghan guy who has now fled the country. He's now in, sitting in Pakistan, hiding over there. And there was a, an Egyptian guy who turned out to be the smartest of them all. His name was something Sohemi. He was a, a, you know, a, a, a failure in life. He, he had studied engineering, couldn't get a job as an engineer. Then he opened a, real, I mean, a, a travel agency. He couldn't succeed. And then his uncle, and this is a very tragic story because you know, <laughs> I, I investigated it. His uncle used to be a mining engineer in Oman. And he had a beautiful farm in Orangeville. And at the age of 60, he retired, came back, and wanted to spend time with his own family. And as soon as he came back, within six months, his uncle was diagnosed with cancer. And the poor guy died a, few, a couple of years later. And I attended his funeral. Very sad story. This guy, Sohemi guy, because his uncle had a farm, so the uncle had a license to get fertilizer for his farm. I mean, this is legitimate, because he had a huge farm over there. And so he lured these kids into this trap, and he said, I will get the fertilizer for you so that we can make explosives. And he collected $4.2 million from the Canadian government. Sure. Imagine the Canadian government, the RCMP, would pay him $4.2 million to hoodwink these, these children into, uh, trap these children into that, that horrible thing. And these children are now sitting in jail. Some of them have spent six years, seven years. Others are still serving 11 years, whatever. And that man is sitting enjoying his life with $4.2 million, and of course he has disappeared. Been, he has been put in some protection program, God knows where he is now, we don't know. But anyway, informants of the government, known to the government, were involved in that plot. There was absolutely no threat to anybody. Those yo-yos didn't even know the difference between fertilizer and just ordinary powder. Yet they paid a very heavy price. And they should. I'm not begrudging that because the security agencies ought to do their job. It, their job is to protect Canadians. Absolutely. But to trap people into these kinds of things is below the belt. It's not fair. It's not appropriate. And there were no threat to anybody at all. They were being lured into this, threat, uh, the, this, this trap, and unfortunately, they fell for it. And look at what those guys, the other guys, those who are misleading them, one guy collects $370,000, the other collects $4.2 million, and I don't know what the Afghan collected, he was a fraud. He would go around uh, uh, across Canada to different mosques saying, I'm an Afghan, we, need, we are helping Afghan refugees, etc., etc., and he'd be collecting money. I know this, he in fact, you know, cheated me as well. He said, his mother needs treatment, could we, you know, help him to, to raise some funds? And I said, okay, I'll put you in touch with some people, perhaps they'll, they can give some donations to you. This is the kind of people that we are dealing with. And so, if we allow our rights and our liberties to be taken away, remember, it takes a long time 
to get our rights back. So please be very careful. Do not succumb to these temptations of fear-mongering because it will destroy the good name of Canada. Thank you, and may God bless you.